So let's get. I would... Yes. Yes, Tessa. I don't want to ask this, although I guess I will. <laughs> How do you, um, any suggestions about if it's going through your head all the time, how to get it to stop. But nope. <laughs> okay. I bless you. Have that keep happening. That's such right. a good thing. Oh. It might be an annoying earworm now, but you're internalizing things. The people that don't internalize these, that don't get the earworm, they never really learn Sanskrit. So this is just what it takes. And, you know, Dr. Williams tells that wonderful story about the great Jerry Larson who was one of the finest Sanskritists in the 20th and maybe 21st century, and probably the sole practitioner these days of Sankhya religion, despite I believe he's, a, he's some sort of minister, Protestant minister. But anyway, he would wake up every morning and he would start with the chanting through all the verbal paradigms, and then he would chant all of the noun paradigms. He knew them cold. He could get through them in about 10 minutes, but that just kept it always fresh. And you'll be reading along once you've got this all memorized and whatnot, when you're actually working and you'll go, what the heck was that? And then you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, it's right there. So getting it in your head is good. So uh, Tessa, I don't feel bad for you. <laughs> I wish they were more in my head all the time. I'm looking for sympathy and I still have to memorize other ones. I just find that that yeah. first one just keeps popping in and going through and I'm like, oh, sometimes I just- That's because it was the first time you heard me chant a conjugation and the brain just stuck to that in a particular way. Could be, I mean, the brain is an interesting thing. All right, so let's share the screen and get moving. We have a lot of fun stuff to cover today. Well, at least fun for me. Um, and I want to start, let's see here. We're gonna start right here with the classic. Um, I use my own rhythm uh, and there are other traditional rhythms. Atlas has a pretty impressive drone. He sent me a video with a very nice uh, droning uh, conjugation that I quite liked. So this is what we're going to do. We're gonna, just going to take a couple of minutes and we're going to do vud. We're going to take another couple of minutes and we're going to do bush. Remember vud means speak, bush means speak. Both of these are in the Atmanepada. Their stem would be vada because in their class, the root takes an a. Uh. But as we saw before in those intricate slides, there are reasons why some of those uhs drop and some of the nuz drop, and yada, yada, yada. But the important thing is, get this in your head. So for our moment of chanting, and there's going to be a lot of chanting today, because this is this is where we're at in Sanskrit. Varati varataha vadanti. Varasi varataha varata. Varami varavaha varamaha. So you should just all just be doing this, just rambling it out. Varati varataha vadanti. Varasi varataha varata. Varami varavaha varamaha, varati varata vadanti, varasi varataha varata, varami varavaha vadamaha, varati varataha vadanti, varasi varataha varata, varami vadava vadavaha vadamaha, varati varataha vadanti, varasi varataha varata, varami varavaha vadamaha. Varati varadaha vadanti, varasi varataha varata, varami varavaha varamaha, varati varataha vadanti, varati varasi varataha varata, varami varavaha varamaha, varati varadaha varanti, varasi varataha varata, varami varavaha varamaha, varati varataha varanti, varasi varataha varata, varami varavaha varamahi. Varati varata varanti, varasi varata varata, varami varavaha vadamaha, varati varataha varanti, varasi varataha varata, varami varavaha vadamaha, varati varataha varanti, varasi varataha varata, varami varavaha vadamaha, varati varataha varanti, varasi varataha varata, varami varavaha vadamaha, varati varataha varanti, varasi varataha varata, varami varavaha vadamaha, 
Varati Varata Vadanti, Varasi Varataha Varata, Varami Varavaha Varamaha, Varati Varataha Vadanti, Varasi Varataha Varata, Varami Varavaha Varamaha, Varati Varataha Vadanti, Varasi Varataha Varata, Varami Varavaha Varamaha, Varati Varataha Vadanti, Varasi Varataha Varata, Varami Varavaha Varamaha, Varati Varataha Vadanti, Varasi Varataha Varata, Varami Varavaha Varamaha, Varati Varata Vadanti, Varasi Varataha Varata, Varami Varavaha Varamaha, Varati Varataha Vadanti, Varasi Varataha Varata, Varami Varavaha Varamaha, Varati Varataha Vadanti, Varasi Varataha Varata, Varami Varavaha Varamaha, Varati Varataha Vadanti, Varasi Varataha Varata, Varami Varavaha Varamaha, Varati Varataha Vadanti, Varasi Varataha Varata, Varami Varavaha Vadamaha, Varati Varataha Vadanti, Varasi Varataha Varata, Vadami Varavaha Vadamaha. All right, now we're going to do bush. Bush, the root, also means to speak. This is an Atmanepada form. We're remembering that those different forms, Parasmipada and Atmanepada, do not have any real semantic value in the era of Sanskrit we're studying. So for bash, bash. All right, so our root becomes basha, and it will have an A attached. The uh is added to it. However, all of that does different stuff here. We're going to remember with the Atmanepada that all of the endings end in A, or as we say in English, E. Bashate, bashete, bashante. Bashase, bashete, bashadwe. Bashase, or bashe, bashawahe, bashamahe. Bashate, bashete, bashante. Bashase, bashete, bashadwe. Bashe, bashawehe, bashawehe, bashamahe. Bashate, bashete, bashante. Bashase, bashasete, bashadwe. Bashe, bashawahe, bashamahe. Bashe. Keep checking. Might help if you take a shot of bourbon in the middle of this. Bashate, bashete, bashante. Bashase, bashete, bashadwe. Bashe, bashawahe, bashamahe. Bashate, bashete, bashante. Bashase, bashete, bashadwe. Bashe, bashawahe, bashamahe. Bashate, bashete, bashante. Bashase, bashete, bashadwe. Bashe, bashawahe, bashamahe. Bashate, bashete, bashante. Bashase, bashete, bashadwe. Bashe, bashawahe, bashamahe. Bashate, bashete, bashante. Bashase, bashete, bashadwe. Bashe, bashawahe, bashamahe. Bashate, bashete, bashante. Bashate, bashase, bashate, bashadwe. Bashe, bashawahe, bashamahe. Bashate, bashete, bashante. Bashase, bashete, bashadwe. So you can tell by my chanting that I don't have as much control over this. This is what I'll I'll see when I when I, I watch the recordings of your videos. This is where you should be like, Dr. Ulrich, you don't have these terribly well memorized. And I'll say, yeah, and I never will. It's the dilemma of dyslexia. So you people with your neurotypicality, you're going to memorize all this damn stuff. And if you can't, you're going to try your best. Because that's what I did. I tried my best. I keep working at it. And eventually you get to a point where you don't need to constantly chant them because you just know what they are, but you never get there until you internalize them. Bashate, bashete, bashante. Bashase, bashete, bashadwe. Bashe, bashawahe, bashamahe. Bashate, bashete, bashante. Bashase, bashete, bashadwe. Bashe, bashawahe, bashamahe. Bashate, bashete, bashante. Bashase, bashete, bashadwe. Bashe, bashawahe, bashamahe. Bashate, bashete, bashante. Bashase, bashete, bashadwe. Bashe, bashawahe, bashamahe. Bashate, bashete, bashante. Bashase, bashete, bashadwe. Bashe, bashawahe, bashame. You really want to get your mouth around it. If, and you can practice chanting these in your head, like when you're walking or in some place that it's inappropriate. But the more you chant them out loud, the better. 
Bashate, bashete, bashante, bashase, bashete, bashadwe, bashe, bashawahe, bashamehe, bashate, bashete, bashante, bashase, bashete, bashadwe, bashe, bashawahe, bashamehe, bashate, bashete, bashante, bashase, bashete, bashadwe, bashe, bashawahe, bashamehe, bashate, bashete, bashante, bashase, bashete, bashadwe, bashe, bashawahe, bashamehe. Bashate, bashete, bashante, bashase, bashete, bashadwe, bashe, bashaw, he bashamehe, bashate, bashate, bashete, bashante, bashase, bashete, bashadwe, bashe, bashaw, he bashamehe. All right. Okay. So we're moving into what we were doing last week, where we were learning the verb to be. And the reason why we want to learn the word to be is because it's a very common Sanskrit noun. Um, and you'll see the word asti and asi and asmi and santi are going to become your favorite words because they're easy to recognize. Now it's irregular. So here it is parsmaipada. So um, the noun can do a couple of things. One, it connects between two nouns. So Rama is king or between a noun and an adjective. The crows are black. Sometimes it's dropped, and we're going to see instances of that in a minute, and it's just provided. So when it's dropped, you have to understand that it's there, because every sentence requires some form of uh, finite verb. Usually, if you're lucky and they're not being jerks, at the very end of the sentence you're translating. So here, very quickly, is another one that follows upon what we had before. We have astistaha santi. So let's just take a minute and repeat after me. Asti staha santi, asmi swaha sma. Asti staha santi, asmi swaha santi, Asmi Asmi <laughs> Now, why do I keep speeding it up like that? Generally, um, actually, I am going to let Jared take this. How does it work when you're singing Kirtan? And how does the speed change when one's chanting? Could you just tell us about that for a second? 
<clears throat> yeah, so it's a natural, as the energy begins to build, it's just a natural um, kind of appropriation of, of, of that energy and the rhythm and the tempo just increase kind of naturally. Yeah, and, and the thing you find is it it naturally happens, but the first time you experience chanting in a large group, a short mantra like Om Namah Shivaya or, um, hey, go, or the Hey Govinda one, when you hear it raise and raise and raise and that energy just builds and builds, and you're like there's something in our humanity that causes us to want to sort of speed up. And the cool thing about chanting a kirtan, at least for me, is that moment when you can't get the words out anymore, you're speaking so fast, you just break down, your brain goes dead silent. And we don't have a lot of times in our lives where our brains go dead silent. But there really is something to chanting in that manner. Okay, now we're actually going to, uh, let me get this screen a little bigger, a little bigger. Come here, come here, you. Stop it. Oh, FYI, we, uh, we won most creative at the Pug Championship this weekend for the Puggiest Catch. There will be pictures. My girlfriend hates them. I think they're kind of cute. Okay, so... These are examples directly from Goldman. And, and a lot of the time in class, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to Goldman's examples because I think they're the best ones out there. So for our first sentence, we have Asti, Asmin, Deshe, Nripaha. So as you're looking at that, you're going to see that there's some Sandhi. Asti, the I at the end has become a Ya. And that attaches to asmin. And then the na attaches to deshe. The cool thing is, these are all locative. Uh, as far as asmin deshe is, which we're going to learn about. Here we want to find the verb first. Always find the verb first. Our verb is right here. Asti. Remember? Asti stahasanti. Asti. So I know that's gonna, that I need something in the nominative to agree with it. And that's in the singular form. So nripa, nripa means king. The king, he astis. Is nripa going to asti? Yes. How is nripa going to asti? He's going to asti asmin deshe in the country. So you'll notice word order is not like we have it in English. Here even the verb is first. I told you it's often a uh, subject object verb. That verb can go anywhere. So, asti, he is, asmandeshe nripaha. So, the first thing I do is I find the verb, it's asti. So, then I know it's going to be singular. My nominative is going to be in the singular. Well, there's my singular, nripaha. Then I have two locatives. So, that's going to be in a place. The, so, asti can be saying something like, there is. So, there's a couple of ways to translate this. The king is in the country, or it could be there is a sort of like a starting verb, asti, there is a king in this country. You could translate them both ways. You'll get there figuring it out. All right, what's our next one? Swarge, Santi Devaha. All right, asti. Could you please use the uh, cursor oh, sure. yeah, along yeah. with these? Sorry. Thanks. Yep, you need it. You need remind me on that. So, swarge santi devaha. So again, santi. Remember, what is my what is the conjugation on that one? Somebody yell it out. Is it singular? Is it plural? That's third plural. Or, third. Well, are we okay for the sake of English? Are we saying third plural? Not versus saying yeah, first plural. Yeah, I think we're going to have to say third plural unless you want to use the indigenous system. I'll try to use both. So this okay, would cool. be pratama, which means first in Sanskrit, but it's third in English. So the pratama form, which is plural, third person in English. Okay, so I know they are. They are. Okay, so I know they are. So I'm going to be looking for a plural noun. Here we have devaha. That is the nominative plural of deva, God. So that means gods. So gods, they are, and then I have another locative, which means in a place, in heaven. So in heaven, swarge, 
Sankti, there are Devaha, gods. So you could say the gods are in heaven or there are gods in heaven. Now, there's a tricky little thing that happens that you need to be aware of. Here we have a sentence, Ramo Nripaha. Does anybody see a verb? It's implied. Yeah, this is an employed one. Or an implied one, an employed one. Ramo, so Rama, that's in the mas masculine singular. And Nripaha is king in the masculine sense in the masculine uh, singular. So when we have these two masculine singers, singulars together, we know that it's going to be something like Rama is the king or King Rama, and then there will be more to the word. This is what's called apposition, when two words are in the same declined case. When two nouns are in the same case, they're considered what we call in apposition which means they should be construed together. Yes, we are all recording. All right, good examples. No, <laughs> see, look at, look at how clever I was there. I wanted to give you this notion of the words here and then some of the different ways they can be translated. All right, here's some examples about apposition again. Um, Kakaha, Krishnaha. All right, well, kakaha, crows, krishnaha, black. So Krishna, the god Krishna, is black, yeah, having black skin or a dark countenance. Kakaha, plural, neuter, or plural, nominative. Krishna, plural, nominative. So there is an implied as here, or there's an implied us. There's an implied santi. Now, we have some other little things we can see. Vanara means monkey. Vanara, monkey. Me bandar nehihu was the first uh, Hindi phrase I learned. I am not a monkey. Vanaro asmi. Here, we know that this is vanaras. And then that sa fucks right off and leaves its shadow behind because there's a short A right here. So vanarosmi is how you would say it out loud. Here, we don't have a subject. The asmi there, that is the verb, I am, asmi, uh, as, asmi, what is it, asmi swahasmaha. So, one second, Atticus. So, asmi, I am. But here, we notice the, the noun has dropped. This, what we would call a copulative noun. The noun that would be you know, uh, that would be I. But the I in I am, you know is there because it's us me. So here the verb remains, but you'll notice that the subject can be removed. Now down here we have vanaro hum, vanaras, the us, the vigraha fucks right off, leaves a shadow of an S behind because of the a. Uh. And we have vanaro aham, here, the verb isn't dropped. Like up here, you could say the noun is implied or the noun is dropped. You don't need the noun. But here, the, the verb very much exists. You can't translate it, monkey I. So I, ahum, and then you assume asmi is here. And because those two are in the same tense, it will be I am a monkey. So kakaha krishnaha, crows are black. But this could also be the black crows and then something else happens in the sentence. This is a complete thought. Vanaro smi, I am a monkey. Vanaro aham is also a complete thought. I am a monkey. And then I wrote down here a little question for you in Sanskrit. Dwaha sandihi staha kaha, meaning there are two sandhis here. Where are they? Yes, Atlas. Okay, so my question is um, with monkey. Mm -hmm. um, basically, like, 
I'm still trying to figure out when you know that something is like originally one of us, like where, I don't know, like maybe I'm looking at the wrong declension or something, but wouldn't it be like, uh, one, one, sorry, one, uh, like, uh, with Wisarga, um, instead of an S, like, I just don't know when that, I don't confuse when that S is there, and that seems to be there a lot, and I don't see it anywhere. Well, we remember when we have short uh at the beginning of a word, and we have short uh plus visarga. The visarga turns into an o, yeah. And then the aham uh, is just attached to it after the uh drops. So where would you look up? Are are you asking where to find the stem vanara? No, like you you said it was vanaras with an s. And I'm wondering where that S comes from because I don't see okay. that in the declension yep. at all. All right. Remember this. Vanaro Vanaraha with a hype with the Visarga, Vanaraha would be actually Vanaras. Your Visarga is actually uh is actually it operates in a sentence like a sa at the end without a vowel on it. So it's not vanaraha aham, it's vanaras aham. So if you were looking on the declension, nominative singular would be what? Purushaha or... Right, Ramaha. I don't see purushas anywhere. All right, let's look at it. Let's look at the paradigm. Our paradigm conjugation is... What page is it on? What page is it on? What page is it on? Uh, 62 on in 62. Goldman. Look at Purushaha at Praptama. Purushaha. So that Purushaha is Purushas. So do you just assume that every Visarga is an S originally? Grammatically, yes. Why? Like Be when you're never going to see that. You have to remember that there's the sa there in order to figure out a lot of the other sundays. So you will see if there's a compound that was, say, um, if I had a compound that I wanted to say uh, a, a man killer, I would give this pure stem, which would be purusha without anything on it. And then I would attach it to huntry killer man killer if i said the man goes to the forest that would be purushaha vanam gachati but because of sandhi the purushaha which is also purushas becomes purusho so purusho vanam gachati so are the rules for Sandhi for a final S and a final Visarga identical? Yes. Cool. Because the final S is the Visarga. I know it's hard to wrap your brain around it. And I've said this a bunch of times and I'm, I'm getting that, that that one's hard to grasp for y'all, but that's okay. It's, I think that what I ultimately needed to hear is that they're treated the same, no matter the fucking what. Yes. Right. They operate the same way. They're effectively the same. I mean, they're effectively the same thing. So I would not be incorrect. Like when you're saying like, okay, you, you see like, uh, Vana rose me, like you, you should think Vana rust us me. Yes. Would I be incorrect in thinking Vana rust us me? No, those are all correct. Okay. Those are all correct. Cool. Interchangeable. Completely. Yes. Good stuff. Yeah, they're the like same it. thing. Okay. <laughs> Thank Good you. Good clarification. No, that's great. Great question. Okay. So there's this problem that I alluded to before. That the us itself as a verb, our asista hasanti, uh, asista hasta, uh, I don't want to asi mahaswaha. Okay. I have a quick question. Yes. Um, back to the Visarga thing. So is that saying like 
in these cases right now, like uh, like a singular nominative form is what it's assuming. Yes, these two are singular nominative. These okay. two are plural nominative. So okay. if you were chanting, when you're chanting, you'll chant it with the Visarga. We always do. Ramaha. We don't chant Ramo because there's no Sunday there. It's on its own. But you could chant it Ramas, but most people chant it Ramo, Ramaha. Or yes, Ramaha, not Ramas. It, it wouldn't be incorrect to chant that. It's just, you have to remember that the Visarga, and if it's a long uh and a Visarga, then it's long uh and then an S with no vowel after it. But if it's, you know, long I Visarga, it could be I are <laughs> in the various ways that Sunday works. But again, we just need to see it in a lot more context. And that's when it'll all kind of come together. All right. So we have this problem where our verb us to be can be omitted and that can create confusion and ambiguity. Now, Goldman says descriptive and predicative adjectives can be confused with nouns and predicate relationship and those in appositions. To which that makes perfect sense to me, but huh? Once again with Goldman, sometimes you don't understand what he's saying until you look at his example. So here we have some common words that we've had a little bit today already. So Krishnaha, uh, Krishna the crow is, oh, that's, ah, hold on. Yeah, let's not, let's correct that right there. Come here, you. Right. So here we're looking at it and we see Krishnaha Kakaha. Well, Kakaha, we heard before, means crow. Nominative singular. Krishnaha is black. It's also in the nominative singular. So here we have a full sentence that says the crow is black. However, the sentence, if it was rendered differently, then this Krishnaha Kakaha could be just a small part of it. Namely, Krishnaha Kako, it's voiced here, va, Vrikshe, Vrikshe means tree, and that E sound tells you that it's in the locative. Vasati, that's the verb vas, which means to dwell or to live or to reside. So here, and you wouldn't say there is a black crow and it lives in the tree. You would say the black crow lives vasati in a tree. In the same way, dasarato, dasharato nripaha. Oh, dasharata is king. Dasharata is Rama's father. You could even say dasharata ramasya. Uh, patihi, if you really want it. So, Dasharata Nripa. Dasharata is the king. However, it might not be that this is a standalone sentence, but is what we call a clause or a chunk of words that go together in a sentence. So, here, further down, our clause is Nripaha Dasharataha or Dasharata Nripaha, Dasharata the king. Jivati from the root jiv, which means to live. Sukham means sweet. You might remember when in the Yoga Sutras, when describing asana, the yogi is prescribed to make their position, their body position, sweet or comfortable and firm. Dridha. Sukham dridha. Asanam. I can't remember the exact phrase in the Yoga Sutras. But so here we have Dasharata is king. All right, cool. Oh, wait, Dasharata is king can be King Dasharata, and that's just going to be my subject. So I condense it into a class, into like my like my subject, which is a descriptor and a name. Dasharata is the name. Nripa is his description. So the big question here is when you're looking at a word and when you're looking at a sentence, when do you have uh, when do you have a verb? When do you have two two things in the same position that are describing one another, or that there's being something declared about them, and the verb us has been denied? 
or has been dropped or is implied. It's still there. So that's a little problem. However, we have a bigger problem. And that is the nouns and declensions. Now, I'll tell you what. I learned Rama. And I know Rama is how I have it just completely memorized. Um, but I'm going to try for Purusha with y'all to try to be in keeping. Uh, I would not be uh, sad if we chose to also to change the one we chant in class to be Rama. But for our first shot, we're going to do Purusha. I think Goldman is somewhat sadistic to choose Purusha as the one for you to memorize because it just that the raw and the retroflex sha is a lot to get your mouth around. So these are the things that that Sanskrit pundits always do. And they're constantly chanting these. This is very much chanting these paradigms is one of the key aspects of Sanskrit learning. So there are a couple ways to chant these. Uh, I put up a couple of examples that we can take a look at but I'm gonna do two of them right away. So the first one, purushaha, purushao, purushaha, purusham, purushao, purushan, purushena, pushabyam, purushai, purushaya, purushabyam, purushabya, purushat, purushabyam, purushabya, purushasya, purushayoho, purushanam, Purushe, Purushayo, Purusheshu, Purusha, Purushao, Purushaha. Now, the, the more traditional one kind of goes like you state the word, and then you'd say, Pratama Vyakti, uh, Pratama Vibhakti, Purusha, 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 Purushaha, Ritya Vibhakti, Purusham, Purusha, Purushan, Ritya Vibhakti, Purushena, Purushabhyam, Purushai, Chaturti Vibhakti, Purushaya, Purushabhyam, Purushabhyaha. Uh, panchami vibhakti purushat purushabhyam purushabhya uh, shashti vibhakti purushasya purushayo purushanam saptami vibhakti purushe purushayo ho purusheshu purusha and then finally sambodana purusha purushas purushao purushaha so that's how this goes and i'm going to explain what these numbers mean here in detail in just a second but what you need to do is you need to jam this paradigm in your head. First off, and we'll do a little bit more analysis on this, but I want to point out some themes to you first. So this is just the stem plus a uh -huh, plus a visarga. So that's a saw that's turned into the visarga. That if you memorize purusha as purushaha, you'll always remember, if you're always memorizing the set the first person um, nominative you'll know the gender of the word. So kanya, if you remember, memorize kanya, maiden, is female. Vanum, forest, if you memorize the word as vanum and not vana, you'll memorize that it is neuter. Okay, so we have the nominative form and we'll note that these two are the same. So your dual is purushao, purushao, purushao. Those are... Um, they're just, that's one thing that you don't have to memorize twice. And you'll notice it's the same down here with the vocative. It's purushao. And the only difference between the vocative and the instrumental is that it doesn't have the h huh at the end of it. It doesn't have that sa or that visarga. Now, these first ones and these top ones are the ones, are, are the tenses you're going to use the most. You won't use the plurals and you'll rarely use the duals, but you have to know them because they will jump up and bite you. So when I get down to Purushena, first thing we notice is that would be just a na, but it becomes retroflex because of the ru and the sha that comes before it. Purushabhyam, Purushai. Okay, so those are all new. I get to Purushaya, the dative. Purushabhyam, all right, that one repeats. Start seeing that shape in your head. Purushabhya. Okay, that's a new one too. Purushat. Got it. Purushabhya again. All right. It's three of those. Purushabhya. Oh, that's the same. Okay. The fourth and the fifth, plural Purushabhya. All right. Genitive. Six. Purushasya. Purushayoho. Purushanam. All right. Okay. So those are 
They're getting longer, but Purushayo, that's a new one. Purushe, Purushayo, Purusheshu, Purushayo, repeats from up here. And then finally, the vocative mean is Purusha, Purusha, Purushaha. So any way you want to do these, you need to kind of start seeing the patterns. I like to do them in color. I don't know if I have a good slide for you on this one, but I made up my own sort of sheets that were only in Devanagari, so I wasn't tempted to just read the um, transliteration. And I, I coded all of the common endings in a similar way so that when I was looking at it and I was repeating it, and chanting it, it would be incorporated in my head in those shapes. So now, what are we doing? So here's our straight up grammar. Here, in nouns, they will either be masculine, neuter, or feminine. And our note here, oh, he doesn't have it here. Uh, I don't have that written out. Anyway, masculine is pumlinga or punlinga. Uh, then feminine is stri linga, stri linga, which is like stri, like a lady's name, stri. And then the neuter is, and this is so much fun to say, napun sakalinga, napun sakalinga, which has always been one of my favorite words. So when you're looking at your word, you are going to identify if it's masculine, neuter, or feminine, and then it'll have a different declension. Now, what about the number? So singular, dual, plural. Here on our chart, we see purushaha, purushao, purushaha. So singular, dual, vowel, or plural. Now, they also have a case. Here it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and sambodhana. When you talk to a Sanskrit pundit, they will only, you'll, you would, if you ask, is this in the accusative state? They'll say, no, it's in the Dwitya state. They just, they don't even think about that terminology. So there are eight cases, unlike the more pleasant Latin, with like five, I believe. I like to think that Sanskrit is like Latin and like German, but to make it just all the more tricky with Sanskrit, it's like it's French for verbs and Germans for nouns. It's the worst of all possible worlds. But once you master the grammar, it, it, it has a certain elegance. So what do these mean? So the preptima is our first. So I'm just gonna kind of review these. I'm gonna go over these in the, um, uh, as they're written on page 62. So purusha. So your pratama form, purusha. That's considered the first, pratama. First, code that in your head. Nominative. It names things. It's the subject of a sentence. Now, in another case, it will be a direct object, but we'll get to that later. But for now, it's the subject of the sentence, the pratama, the first form. Dvitya. So here, purusham. That's second. Purusham, second. Accusative, direct object case. You'll notice that I'm going directly down the far left column on Purusha. Tritya, the third. This is kind of my favorite one. Instrumental, agentive. And in some cases, the uh, subject case. We'll see why later. Chaturti, fourth. That's the dative case. It's an indirect, an indirect object case. It's a little hard to think about because we don't have it so clearly in English. Um, it's like you're doing something on behalf of someone or you're giving something to someone. Called dative from the Indo-European da, which means to give. Panchami, fifth. This is called the ablative, the source case. It comes from this place. This is one of these tricky things with Sanskrit where you need to learn English to learn Sanskrit. Uh, I've always noticed that people that come into Sanskrit who have a background Greek or Latin uh, or even German, they grasp this aspect a lot more. Because in English, what we use to mark these cases are actually prepositions. The words that are used before a direct object in order to specify, how do you say? 
specified direction. So a preposition in the puppy, over the puppy, under the puppy, around the puppy, you know, against the puppy. So shashti, the sixth, the genitive. This is possessive. This is the case that's like of. So um, this means like, uh, as I said, Michael, son of Jerry. So it's the of case. It connects things and sets up possession. Septimi, the seventh, is the locative or the location case. Now we're actually going to see that the object of a, of a verb is that of motion is in the accusative, not the locative. But other verbs that aren't the object of uh, other verbs that do not have uh, that do not involve motion uh, are, are going to be in straight locative. So the boy hit the ball in the park. And finally, the eighth one, which is sort of theoretical, it's called the sambodana, and that's the vocative. So it addresses someone. This is like what I'm saying. Hey, Rama. Hey, hey, Rama. All right. Now, in more English, the pratama is the subject of a sentence. There's no preposition in English. The boy. The boy does something. I mean, if anything, the subject would be the article, the uh or the the. The pratama, the ramaha, the purushaha are all in the subject case. So in ramo vanam gachati, which is ramas vanam gachati, it would be um, rama as in the nominative. Dwitya, the second, the object. This one, the object of a verb that is transitive. We'll talk about transitive and intransitive, but a, a verb that does something to something will have its object in the second. The boy hit the ball. The ball here is the object, and that will be put in the dwitya. Dwitya, the third instrument or accompaniment also. So here I add both uses of instrumental in our sentence. The boy with his friend, so that would be Mitrena with his friend, hit the ball with a stick. The stick would be also in the instrumental. So the boy would be the in, would be in the nominative with his friend would be in the instrumental. Hit is the verb. The ball would be in the object case, the dwitya, the accusative. And final, finally, instrumental again with a stick. So when you're using the instrumental form, it can be someone accompanies someone or it can be an instrument. It is a thing by which stuff is done. Chaturta. The fourth, so this is the source. Um, you can think of it as the giving case. The boy uh, hits the ball with, uh, now that's actually a bad example. I didn't think that went through right. Uh, blah, blah, blah. So uh, the boy, boy buys a ball for his friend. Much better. So the source case, what you're doing it toward. Um, this is one of the more nuanced ones and it has a fair amount of ambiguity. Punchami, fifth, the source case. Now, this can be the cause or the source. So the boy from Cleveland, aha, the boy from Cleveland hit the ball. ball. So Punchami says the boy is from Cleveland. However, if he was due to being angry, he hit the ball with the stick, then due to being angry or due to anger would be in the ablative. We can also remember that emotions take the ablative. So you are afraid from fear, not afraid because of fear or not terrified by fear, which would be instrumental. You are afraid from fear. Shashti. The sixth, possession and correlation. So the boy of the Robbins clan, of the clan of people named Robbins. 
So here we're describing the boy using the sixth tense, this genitive. Also, you have the son of the boy. Oh, so the son of the boy. So that's relationship and possession again. Uh, the bat of the boy, that's also possession. So of the boy. The boy from the Robin's clan is more like a correlation, as I call it. Seven, location, subtomy. In the park, the boy hits the ball. So the locative tells you exactly where something is happening, where the verb happens. And all of these nouns are related to verbs. You have a verb and then you'll have a stack of nouns and the relationship between these nouns is declared by the case endings. Now, how does Maurer on page 49 define this? I think he does it pretty well. Nominative, the priest as the subject of worships. If you have the priest worships, the priest would be the subject. Accusative, Vishnu, the priest worships Vishnu, the object of the verb worship. So the priest worships Vishnu, Vishnu is in the accusative. Instrumental, with rice. The instrument or medium used by this priest to worship Vishnu. So the priest, subject, verb, worships, Vishnu, object accusative, with rice, saldanum, would be instrumental. The rice is used. Dative, for the king, the person for whom the act of worship is performed. Because often when a priest in a Hindu temple is doing worship, he's not doing it for himself. He's doing it on behalf of others. So maybe dative is a good way to think of it as um, on behalf of. For the king, the priest, subject, verb, worships, Vishnu, accusative, instrumental, with rice, dative, for the king. From the field, ablative. This tells you where the rice comes from, from which the rice comes. So the priest, subject, worships, verb, Vishnu, who's the object, with rice, instrumental, from the field, ablative, and then finally, for the king. Now, genitive. Here we're using the term of the peasant, which expresses the relationship between two words. In this, we have a possessive relationship. So you could, so you could say, from the field of the peasant. Again, the priest, subject, nominative, worships, verb, accusative, object, accusative, Vishnu, with rice, instrumental, from the field, ablative, of the peasant, genitive, then dative for the king. You'll notice in English that I have to keep switching around the word order. In Sanskrit, you don't have to. You can just have all these slapped down. And it's up to you to kind of sort them all out. Locative, in the country, the place where the act of worship is carried out. The priest, nominative, verb, worships, Vishnu, object, with rice, instrumental, from the field, ablative, of the peasant, genitive, in the country for the king. Or you could do for the king in the country. Or the priest in the country worships. And finally, vocative. So let's say I was stating that to someone. I would say, oh, dear friend, vocative. In the country, locative. The priest, nominative. Accusative, worships, or verb worships. Vishnu, accusative with rice, instrumental, from the field, ablative, of the peasant, genitive, for the king, dative. So that's a lot, that's a lot, but you don't have to learn it all. 
You don't have to get it all right away. Every time you read a Sanskrit sentence from now on, you're going to use this system. Now, as kind of my last point before we move on to the second part of the class, I wanted to look at a number of words. Now, these are really basic uh, and they show the different ways that the accusative form, that is a direct object, can be used. And I want you to both think about the Sanskrit, but also think about the English, because I want you to start thinking about English. When you're thinking about English and you're speaking a sentence like, oh, that would be in the nominative. Oh, that would be in the indicative. See, or that would be in the instrumental. See the way that we use all these same concepts, but we don't, uh, we do not decline our nouns. So here's the first one. Maharajaha. Desham Rakshati. All right. Maharajaha, nominative. Desham, which means the country. That's in the accusative. Rakshati, so that is in the uh, pratama form of the root raksh, to protect. The king, Maharaja, protects Rakshati Desham. Now, here we get some, some interesting ones. Ooh, look at this one. Tapasa yogam acharati. This is a great one. Tapasaha. So that means nominative singular of one who does ascetics or tapaha. So tapaha becomes tapa tapasaha. Someone who does ascetic practices, who builds up fiery uh, virtue. Tapasaha yogam acharati. Acharati, a prefix plus char. Char means to course, to do, to practice, to enact. So tapasaha charati yogam. Here, the ascetic is doing the yoga, which, and doing the yoga, the thing he's doing is put in the accusative. Vangaraha, we learned that one a minute ago. Monkey. Vriksham. Yeah, we learned that one too. Accusative, tree. Arohati, which is the prefix a plus the Sanskrit root ru, becomes rohati to climb, to sort of bear upwards. So nagaraha arohati vriksham. In this sense, the direct object shows the thing that the monkey is acting upon, that he is climbing. Sarpaha manusham. Dashati. Oh, that's a good one. Scary. Sarpaha means snake. Serpent, Indo-European. Manusham, human, man, also Indo-European. Dash is our root here. D, Aniswara, Sha, Dash. Dashati. The serpent, Danshati, bites Manusham, the man. Balaha. Aharam kardati. Balaha means a young child. Kardati, kardati, same root in Hindi for uh, kanakan, kad, to eat. And then aharam means like a thing that you've taken up or food. The child, balaha, nominative, aharam, food, accusative, kardati, eats. Tapasaha, uh-oh, plural. Tapasaha, devam, yajanti. Ooh, is a good one. From the root yaj, not yoj or yuj, yaj, to worship. Yajanti is plural. So tapasaha, aha, that's plural. So the plural of tapasaha, and I know I need a plural because I see the plural in the verb, yajanti. And what is the ascetic to worship? Devam, a god, singular accusative. Shishaha grantam patanti, put from the Sanskrit root to be or to read. Put, put. That means to read, and it's in the plural. So that's the um, Pratama Purusha plural or English third person plural. Read. Who reads? Someone in plural. Shishaha. The students. 
Shishyaha Grantam Patati. The students read the book. Finally, Naraha. Naraha Vihagam Pashanti. Pashanti is plural, from Pash to see. Naraha, men, and plural, accusative, or no, nominative. Nominative men, Naraha, Pashanti, they see Vihagam. Vihagam. Vihagam means bird. It's not a common word for bird, but I'm glad you're getting to learn that. Okay. When we get, I would like you to open Goldman to page 61, and this will be the last thing we do before our break. On Goldman, page 61, we have an example that uses all of the tenses in one sentence. Having heard Dasharata's speech, having come out from the city, and having come here with Lakshmana, Rama lives in the forest for the sake of righteousness. So, having heard Dasharata's speech, subjunctive, and accusative speech of Dasharatha, and having come out from the city, ablative, and having come here with Lakshmana, with Lakshmana, which is in the instrumental, instrumental for accomplishment, then Rama, our subject, we're just getting our subject, lives in the forest, locative, for the sake of righteousness, dative. So what we do see here is that this having heard and having come, these are called gerunds, um, but they're not like gerunds in English. They are, um, a, they're a verbal form that suggests something that happened before the main verb. So I'm gonna go through this in the Sanskrit one or two times, and I want you to read along. Try to read the Devanagari. Dasharatasya vacha, or dasha, <laughs> Dasharatasya vachanam shrutva nagaran nisritya or nisritya lakshmanena sahe sahehagatya sahehagatya dharmaya vane vasati ramaha. So when I'm looking at this, and this is your first lesson in translating, and we're going to be translating next week. First thing I do is I find my verb, vasati. Aha, that is like, what did we learn? Vadati. Okay, vasati is my word. That's from the root vas. That means to live. Okay, so I've got vasati. Now, I know I'm going to need a singular nominative to really, you know, to match vasati. Here I have Ramaha. All right, good. Rama lives. However, I go back to the beginning and I notice that I have two of these gerunds. So when I translate, I find the verb, I find the subject, and then I look for these, what are called gerunds. So the first one is dasharatasya vachanam shrutva. Shrutva is from the root shru, to hear. So having heard, shrutva, and then read to the left. Having heard and reading to the left really helps. Read to the left from the verb and read from the left from a gerund or a verbal. So, shrut, so I go, shrutva vachanam, speech, dasharatasya, of dasharata. Cool, I'm done with that. I can just throw it aside. So having heard the speech of dasharata, I write that down. Then I go, nagaran, mm-hmm, nisritya. Well, nagaran means city, and you'll notice that it has um that it has attached to ni ni sritya now sritya srit means to emerge and nihi means outward actually that nihi is the same nihi that's in nirvana vana i like to say wind or exhalation near out blown out so ni sritya having emerged and where did he emerge from nagaran the city oh wait a minute, what's that not doing there like that? What's that not? Oh, I remember a ta, when it approaches a nasal like this, actually transforms 
into the nasal of its class, namely dental here. So nagarat becomes nagaran plus nistrikya. So there, look, we're practicing sandhi again. All right, that's another gerund. So nistrikya means having emerged. I got that. Nagarat, ablative from the city. Cool. All this is done. I've got having heard the speech of Dasharatta, got it, and having emerged from the city, got it. Now I only have the one verb left, or do I? Hmm. Saheha gatya. Uh oh, uh oh. What that is is the word saha plus iha plus agatya. That agatya is another jaren, meaning having come. So agatya, he has, has come. Where did he come? He came iha, saha, iha, agatya, because it's saha plus iva, or plus iha becomes saheha, and then that eha connects with agatya. So that's saha, iha, agatya. That's real Sunday. This is the type of Sunday you'll see regularly. And then Lakshmanena. Got it. That's in the instrumental. All right, so I got three parts. I've got uh, Dasharatasya Vachanam Shrutva, having heard the speech of Dasharata. Nagaran Nisritya, or Nagarat Nisritya, having emerged from the city. Lakshmanena sahe iha agatya, sahe agatya, and having come here along with, accompanied by Lakshmana, his brother, Lakshmanena saha agatya. All right, that's it. Now I go to my final verb, vasati. And I know Rama is doing the vasati. Rama lives. Where does he live? Vane. He lives in the forest. Vane is locative. Why does he all do this? Dharmaya. That is in the dated. For the sake of Dharma. What's the point of this sentence? After a terrible speech by his father, Rama, there's a lot that goes into it, has to leave the city. He happily leaves, uh, in an unpleasant way, going along with his brother, Lakshmana, and then they go to live in the forest, for a long period of time, and they do that because it's the right thing to do for righteousness. Okay, that is, makes it time for a break. Let me find, where are you? So get yourselves relaxed, uh, and I will see you in five minutes. Avahi avandamahi yoho gaurisho where something is residing in this now.
Hi, my name is Alina Popular. I'm Okay, we are coming back. And we are going to talk about a neuter noun. Now, as I said, any noun will have a number. So, ekavachana, duivachana, bahuvachana, the number of people involved. And it will have a number that declares what the case is. And then it will also be masculine, feminine, or neuter. Kustakam book is neuter. Kustakam is the one that uh, Goldman chooses to use. And I think I remember I memorized Pustakam, but I also memorized Vandam. Vandam is a nice one. All right. So here 
what do we want to look at? Let's let's quick. I'll chant through it once, and then we'll do some a paradigm analysis. Pustakam, pustake, pustakani, pustakam, pustake, pustakani, pustakena, pustakabia, pustakabiam, pustakai, pustakaya, pustakabiam, pustakebiaha, pustaka, pustakat. Pustakad, that's ta and da, depending on the voicing coming afterwards. Pustakabiam, pustakebiaha. Pustakasya, pustakayoho, pustakanam, pustake, pustakayoho, pustakeshu. Hey, pustaka, hey, pustako, hey, pustakani. It's kind of good to throw those hays in there. So you remember it's the sambodhan or the vaka. Now, the first thing you'll notice is the pratama form, that's the nominative form, and the dvitya form, that's the accusative form, are exactly the same. So the neuter is fine, because you're like, pustakam, pustake, pustakani, and pustakam, pustake, pustakani. Good, you got it. Pustakam, pustake, pustakani, pustakam, pustake, pustakani. Done, I'm set. And then I go down to the trityya, pustakena, pustakabiam, pustakahi or pustakai, it's hard for me to say. Does anybody notice something familiar about this third number, this number three? What does it look like? Does it look like something else we've seen? It exactly mirrors our previous word. So the only difference between um, purusha, which would be purushaha, purushao, purusha, purushaha, purusham, purushao, purushani. The only difference here is that it's pustakam, and there it's also pustakam in the first and second, pustake, pustake, and the dual, not, not like purushao, purushao and pustakani, pustakani. So those double too, instead of purushaha and purushani. So when you come to the neuter, it's not that different. So pustake, like purushe. Uh, then we have pustakabiam, purushabiam. Pustakai, uh, purushai. And the fourth, the dative, the giving form. Pustakaya, well, it's all, that was purushaya. Pustakabiam, Purushabiam, Pustakabia. Oh, that was Purushabia. All right, coming out of the fifth. Pustakat. Oh, yeah, Purushat. Pustakabiam. Oh, Purushabiam. Purush. 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 Oh, sorry, I want to. Uh, Pustakabia. Purushabia. Pustakasya in the genitive. Puru, purushasya. Pustakayoho, Purushayoho. Pustakanam, Purushanam. Pustake, Purushe. Pustakayoho, Purushayoho. Pustakeshu, Puru, Puru, <laughs> Purushesu. Hey, Pustaka. Hey, Purusha. Hey, Pustake. Hey, Purushe. Hey, Pustakani. Hey, Purush. Hey. Uh, Purushani. So the, the neuter and the masculine are virtually identical except for the first two lines. So we, we remember we were looking at the uh, another paradigm. So here's our Purusha. So these lines are going to be are going to be this are, are the ones that are different between masculine and neuter. In the neuter, everything is the same from trichia on downward as it is when you decline the masculine. Yes, Atlas. You answered my question. Thank you. Okay. So again, patterns. You want to do patterns. Um, I a, pardon? I have a question for you. Sure. On the, yes. On the like, nominative, um, vocative third person. In the book, it, it ends in A, B, Sagra, A, H, right? And the last one in neuter ends in A, N, I. So aren't those different? 
Yes. So that's the only difference. So Pustakam, Pustake, Pustakani, Purushaha, Purushe, uh, Puru, Purushaha. So Pustakam, Pustake, Pustakani again, Purusham, Puru, uh, Purushe, or is it Purushal? I can't remember. Uh, Purushal. Purushal. Yeah, it's Purushao. I can never remember those ones. So Purushao, and then Puru, and then on that one, it's Purushan. So you need to just remember that these six boxes are different between the neuter and the masculine. Now, let's try this. Here it's transliterated. You have Ramao, Ramaha, Ramaha. Ramam, Ramau, Raman, Ramena, Ramabiam, Ramai, Ramaya, Ramabiam, Ramabia, Ramat, Ramab, Ram, <laughs> Ram, uh, what's that saying? Ramabia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. It's the, it looks weird to me. What's that doing there? Ram, uh, oh, yeah, there's an error in this one. So it's Ram Abya, or it's Ram Abyam. They, they, the Yah slipped out of there. See, it's not just me. Ramat, Ram Abyam, Ram Abyaha. So on this one, it's good to kind of look at the day, not look at the transliterating. Ramasya, Ramao, Yoho, Ramam, Rame, Rama, Yoho, Rameshu. Remember Rama, but then you know it's also Ramao, Ramaha. So Ramaha, Ramao, Ramaha, Ramam, Ramao, Raman. Ramena, Ramabiam, Ramai, Rama, uh, Ramaya, Ramabiam, Ramabiaha, Rama, Ramat, Ramabiaha, Ramabiam, Ramabiaha, Ramasya, Ramayoho, Ramam, Rame, Ramayoho, Ramesu. I learned them originally. Ramaha, Ramam, Ramena, Ramaya, Ramat, Ramasya, Rame. You know, Rama, Rama, Ramabiam, Ramabiam, Ramab, Ram, Ramayoho, Ramayaho, Ramau. Ramaha Raman Ramahe Ramebiaha Ramebiaha Ramanam Rameshu Ramaha. Now, let's get jiggy with it. This is the point of the class that I think you all will enjoy. Where is that thing? All right, if you go over to your canvas, um, you'll see the section that says modules. Under modules, you have all of the weekly modules. But if you go all the way down to the bottom, actually, let, let me share my screen so I can show this all to you. Uh, where's my data? Yes. So you're over here. You're going all the way down here well, after week nine, all the way down to the bottom, you will get to these extra modules, these extra resources. So for say Sunday, I have different resources, descriptions I put together, some quotes and whatnot. But at the very bottom, you will see resources on declension. Now, there are extracted uh, PDFs of various readings and why I think you should read them. You should especially read Rattling the Dry Bones of Grammar. And you can see our different people that treat this concept of the um, declensions. However, we have other resources. So, oh, we're not. So this is a great resource because, and I'll show you in a minute. Indicates the columns denote the. So what you look at here, you look on your screen, you'll see you have Ramal, Ramam, Ramaha. Hey Rama, hey Rama, hey Ramaha. They put the vocative up front. And this little 26 minute thing will chant through almost all of the nouns and the verb paradigms, conjugations. But it's not terribly easy to use. The nice thing is you have a proper Indian voice and that makes a big difference. So let's listen to Rama for a second. Singular, dual, and plural forms of the noun. Prathama Vibhakti relates to the subject case. Sambodhana Prathama is when we address the subject, as in hailing someone. Dvitiya denotes the object case of the noun. 
I, I think you might be muted. I don't know if it's just Sorry, me. yeah, no, that was me. You can't get enough of this. You can't hear this enough times at the beginning, and that's why I keep repeating it. This baffled me. I just, because I couldn't understand it in English, but it becomes so natural, and you'll find that your English, by thinking about Sanskrit this way, is really going to change and become significantly more precise. I drive my girlfriend nuts, because my insistence on precision due to Sanskrit. Oh. Okay. Chaturthi indicates when some other noun in the same. Typically, the recitation of this uh, noun table is a oral practice in a kind of um, verse like fashion. I will do the recitation now with intermediate gap so that you can follow me and re mouth what I say per each row. With the title, all right, so follow along. Akarantaha Pulinda Rama Shabda. Would you enlarge the video so we can actually see this along with it, please? Is that enlarged at all? Ramaya. Okay. No. Well, I don't know how to do that right now. <laughs> so let's do something a little bit different. Come on. All right. Hurry up along with your ads. Yes, yes, yes. Ramaya. Ramabhyam. Ramabhya. All right. I'm going to go like this. Ramat. Now is it big? Can you see it now? Okay. All right. So the recitation. He's chanting right along. We're gonna let, we're gonna follow along with this guy. With intermediate gap, so that you can follow me and re mouth what I say per each row. We always start off with the title. So here we start off. Akarantaha pullingaha Rama shabdaha. Okay, that phrase, a kara anta, the short a uh, sound at the end. Punlinga means masculine. Rama is the word that's going to be chanted, and shabda means word. Okay, so that's how traditionally they'll begin the chant. Rama, Ramo, Rama, He Rama, He Ramo. Hey, Ramaha. Ramam, Ramo, Raman. Ramena, Ramabhyam, Ramaihi. Ramaya, Ramabhyam, Ramebhya. Ramat, Ramabhyam. Ramebhya Ramasya Ramayoho Ramanam Rame Ramayoho Rameshu I hope you could uh, fill in the intermediate gaps with your own recitals. Now I will recite it all. We will all recite it together. Try to recite it along with me.
I think you might be muted. Oh. I want to be I muted right now. But we can't hear the video if you're muted. Uh, yeah. Uh, That's foolish. Okay. Well, all right. Live and learn. So I want you to go back to there. And that was that that is a really useful resource. 26 minutes, he chants all the paradigms. Now, what else do we have? And here, oh. here we have another. This is the first declension I found. It does Rama. It sounds it's really clean, but the accent I'm not crazy about on. So now if you want to follow along, uh, oh crap, I don't have a Rama thing. So you can look at your, uh, you can look at Purusha. But so I just want you to hear the difference. Just listen to this. Rama. A ending masculine, the word Rama. Ramaha, Ramo, Ramaha, Ramam, Ramo, Raman, Ramena, Ramamham, Ramaihi, Ramaya, Ramamham, Ramabya, Ramat, Ramabham, Ramabya, Ramasya, Ramayo, Ramanam. Rami, Rama Yoho, Rame Su. He Rama, He Ramo, He Rama. So that one's really nice. It's clean. And you're starting to hear the different accents. And so you can also start to hear Sanskrit that's not being spoken by Dr. Williams and I. Now, hang on to your hats, because this guy. This one is the best. This is the absolute best one. So this guy's accent is just beautiful. He sounds like a South Indian. Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha. Good morning, my dear students. Today, I'm going to teach you Vyakarana Vibhagaha, Grammar, Shabdaha. Akarantaha, Pumlingaha, Rama, Shabdaha. Yeka Vachanam, Dvi Vachanam, Bahu Vachanam. Prathama vibhakti hi Ramaha Ramau Ramaha Dvitiya vibhakti hi Ramam Ramau Raman. Here they have given Raman, but it should be Raman. Okay, happens to the best of us. Ramena Ramabhyam Ramaihi. Chaturthi vibhakti hi Ramaya Ramabhyam Ramebhya Panchami vibhakti hi Ramat Ramabhyam Ramebhya Sashti vibhakti hi Ramasya Ramayoho Ramanam Saptami vibhakti hi Rame Ramayoho Rameshu Sambodhana Prathama Vibhakti He Rama He Rama He Rama Yevam Krishna Govinda Mukunda Yitya Dayaha What does it mean by that? Like Rama Shabda, you can say Krishna Shabda, the Shabda, Mukunda Shabda. How? Krishna Ha Krishna Krishna Ha. Krishnam, Krishna, Krishna, like this. Okay. So that is just that, that is so beautiful to me. He's got just that temple Brahmin accent. Um, and I wish I'd learned it that way, but it I it really does I like saying Pratima, Ditya, it all internalizes all of it. Um, we all have to find our own ways to memorize these things so they're the most effective. Now you could go another way. Hang on to your butts.
राम 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 yeah so that happened it if you want to memorize it that way and it works for you i will try to not run to the hills when i hear you chant it so here you heard you know four different ways of chanting this and there are some really subtle variations that has to do with pronunciation Dr. Williams makes an excellent point about pronunciation, that if you pronounce a word wrong, that's okay. That means you're learning the word. If someone corrects you, that's great. That's how you learn it. When I first went to India, I kept trying to get directions back to the place I was staying, which was Lajpat Bhavan, and I kept calling it Lajpat Bhavan. And all oh, those cab drivers did not care. I will not take you there, sir, until you say Bhavan properly. This is not no Bhavan, 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 Bhavan. And, you know, I learned. So those are a number of ways to chant these. And you've got to find the best way to do it on your uh, for yourself, really. Um, come on, stop sharing. So this is kind of where I want to leave us today. Let me quick, uh, I want to look at one last slide. So you'll have this PowerPoint, as always. Um, I want you to be starting to chant Purusha or Rama. Um, we, I wanted to go over these one more time here, but I'll just say them out loud. Varati, varata, varanti, varasi, varata, varata, varami, varawaha, varamaha. Bashate, bashete, bashante, bashase, bashete, bashadwe, bashe, bashawahe, bashamahe. So practicing those, you're going to be able to spit them out so fast for a minute. You're going to record a video of yourself doing that before class next time. And you're going to upload it to me. And then we're going to have our quiz at the beginning of the class. So we are going to continue. You should continue studying Goldman. Study the different examples. I want you chanting those verbs two times a day for at least 10 minutes. The verbs are getting you warmed up and getting you to practice your uh, memorization muscles. Soon, as soon as you are ready, listen to those different videos. Find the one you like the most and incorporate either Rama or Purusha, I'm comfortable with either. I'm probably giving you, you know what, fuck that. We're not doing Purusha, we're doing Rama. Rama is what's happening. You're memorizing Rama, it's good for you. So don't do Purusha, because it's hard to say, Rama is better. Listen to those three different pronunciations and start attuning yourself to the different ways Sanskrit can be speaking, spoken. And honestly, in every single one of those, the pronunciation is, is quite good. So you're not learning it from this Malaysia Gora mouth, uh, and you're actually learning it from the mouth of the pundit. I want you to, if you have the time, begin practicing the reading assignment, which is on page 75. The majority of our work uh, for next week will be reading in class and translating that reading assignment. So just read over it a couple times. If you can think you can break some Sundays, whatever, Try to not transliterate it too much because you'll make errors and then you won't be able to translate well. The last thing we're going to do as far as grammar after the quiz will be, we're going to look at examples from Goldman of how to use these words in sentences. And we are going to learn personal pronouns. And after that, if we have the time, I wanna do an activity where we start kind of speaking Sanskrit, generating our own sentences. And I have a couple of ideas to do this. Dr. Williams got me inspired when I watched his video. So that's your homework. A, B, C, always be chanting. 
So this is the time. We went from learning to write in code to now memorizing stuff. And there's just no way around it. You have to memorize it. I, I asked my I asked my pundit how to memorize things. He's like, you just memorize them. And he would just sing them to us. And But how do I memorize them? And he's like, here, let me sing it to you. But wait, how do I get it in my head? Let me sing it to you. That's it. That's the traditional way. You sing the declensions. You sing the conjugations until it's all just kind of jammed in your head. I recommend that you do it formally, twice a day, as I'm saying. But also, if that earworm pops into your head, run it. Chant it in your head while you're doing dishes or out loud. Annoy people. Scream at strangers. Um, for writing out the quiz, just be chanting and practice writing out us and bash uh, paradigms or, or conjugations in the Devanagari. Other than that, does anybody have any questions? Yeah, I think you just said us and bash. Bash. Do you mean vud? Or do but you <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. But but and Bosch. <laughs> Got everything confused. You can you can chant us too if you're in there. The thing is, any one of these paradigms and conjugations, you, you need to practice chanting. And I'm gonna make a point of us doing a little bit of chanting through these these things pretty regularly. Now, I will warn you, there are 10 different forms of verbs that you're gonna have to be kind of chanting, but there's more like 15. Well, how many are there? I think there's 15 uh, noun paradigms, depending on the ending of the word and whether it's masculine or, or uh, whether it's masculine, feminine or neuter. So that you just want to get in the practice of chanting them. And the more you get the muscle memory, as you learn the newer ones, you're like, OK, this one maps onto this one. I'm not having to learn it fresh every time. My dumbass with the way my brain works, I had to approach each paradigm and memorize it fresh every time. Why? Because that's the way my brain works. And other people I found when they really internalized the Rama, then when they did say Vunnam, which is neuter, they'd just be like, all right, it's all the same. And then boom, and then I change those two top. All right, I got it. Um, if your brain can do that, that's awesome. But regardless, get your mouths around it. Always be chanting. Okay, everybody, I will see you next time. Don't panic. I know this was a lot today. But all of this will become so second nature to you. And the most horrible thing is when you really start studying and reading Sanskrit regularly, you start finding things like accusative genitives or instrumental nouns or the dative ablative. They, they get all kind of jumbled and nuanced. But for now, remember it like I learned it, or like I taught you. So understand the English concepts, be chanting the thing, and if you can, connect the English content concepts to the numbers as you're chanting as much as possible. Okay. I got to go record class for my other class. It never ends. All right. Bye-bye, y'all. You got bye -bye. this. I'm looking, forward to next, I'm looking forward to our next class. Thank you. This was a wonderful class for me. I really enjoyed seeing all of you. Same. It was fun to practice together. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Doing it together is the best. Yes, it is. Thanks.